Melissa, you let me know when uh, you're ready. We are ready whenever you are. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Bernardino City Council meeting of October the 27th, 2020. I appreciate everybody being here. I'll call this meeting to order, and may we please have a roll. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Mason? Here. Councilmember Medina? Here. Vice Mayor Salazar? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. Uh, if you would please join us uh, uh, for the pledge, and uh, we'll all get in sync and, and uh, uh, do the pledge uh, as a council, please. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. We're doing pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on to item number three, public comments for items not on the agenda. Individuals will be allowed three minutes. It is the council's policy to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the council from discussing on or acting on the matter uh, that's not agendized pursuant to state law. City Clerk. I see no hands up. Okay. I yeah, I still see no hands raised. Okay, so we're going to move on to item number four, announcements and presentations. First item uh, was to have had um, introduced our new superintendent for the San Bernardino Park Schools, Mr. Uh, Jose Espinoza. Unfortunately, he has district business and they have a special district board meeting that he uh, and the board are attending, so um, he will not be here this evening, but we will look uh, hear from him sometime soon. Item number two, or B, I'd like to introduce the newly appointed Skyline College President, Dr. Melissa Marino, and receive an update on Skyline College activities. What I would like to say is welcome, Madam President, and uh, very fortunate that I believe it's your 88th day um, since uh, we, we had a conversation, so I, I, I'm ta tallying it for you. Um, but uh, I will say that we had an excellent conversation. I'm already seeing that you're reaching out to the community, the staff, students, um, and I'm very excited. Uh, had a very good good conversation and feel really that uh, Dan Bruno and Skyland College has been fortunate to have you um, come here and uh, to be a part of our community. So with that, I would please love to turn over the meeting to you uh, and um, Introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor Medina and uh, Vice Mayor Salazar and Council Member. Thank you so much for having me. I have a, uh, I've prepared a very short uh, presentation, so I would like to be able to share my screen. I think I already have permission, and if it's okay with you, I would like to go ahead. Please. So um, I have a short agenda. I'm going to share a little bit about me personally and, um, and about my four priorities that I've developed in the short period of time that I've been here. Uh, and then I have a few slides to share uh, sort of the state of the college and, um, and then the open invitation. So first of all, um, you know, I had a first career as a small business owner, and I'm a licensed attorney and California broker, and I had a property management company that included um, hotel ownership. And so I actually owned a hotel in Arizona and Bozeman, Montana, and that kept me busy for a long time. And I kind of consider myself an accidental administrator. I really just wanted to teach in the community college system, and I was identified um, to do a number of projects in my uh, almost 19 years in the system. I started at UCSB 
as a uh, paralegal uh, program uh, director, and um, and then I switched to uh, Santa Barbara City College, and I was the founding director of the Entrepreneurship Center, where we invited the Small Business Development Center and hosted that for a while, and I did a lot in the uh, in the local uh, business community and developed such strong relationships there, and I eventually was promoted to the Dean of Business, and, uh, and then I was the Vice President of Extended Learning, which I was responsible for community-based programming. I took a $2 million revenue-generating program to a $10 million revenue-generating program in my time as Vice President, and we developed the Career Skills Institute, and um, all the program was free to the community, so that was such a great run, and when I um, applied to become president at Skyline College, um, I really, I think Skyline chose me as much as I chose Skyline, and um, Skyline College is just an amazing and unique place, and I'm so uh, humbled by the team there and the talent, and I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by uh, the great things that are happening there, and I'm so excited to have joined the community to lead uh, this community. So uh, we have some shared values and purpose at Skyline College, and I think I'm a great match as the president because um, Skyline puts students first, and that is just so important, and I've spent a lifetime in service of others, and so I bring this um, student-focused, authentic collaboration mindset. Uh, Skyline is the leader in uh, equity training in the state and in our district. And um, I also bring um, very open, honest transparency. And I would like to think I bring some love and humor to Skyline College with a positive approach to doing business there. And um, and also, I just want to share a little bit about my leadership philosophy and style. I, I believe in a democratic, bottom-up uh, way to uh, lead programs and people, and I believe that it is the community and the people that will shape the future of Skyline College. I leave my ego at the door, and I do believe that in order to affect change, you need to be just disruptive enough. And so you're right, uh, Mayor Medina, I, today is my 88th day, and I have spent this time really carefully observing and listening and learning about Skyline College and the people there and understanding our students and our programs. And so after 88 days of listening and observing, I've come to uh, understand that our educational landscape is fundamentally changing and um, I think for the first time in a while at uh, San Mateo County Community College District, that funding is a little uncertain because the state's funding is uncertain. And there are external pressures and forces. And so we are, you know, Skyline and the district are leaders in student success, but this is a very uh, sharp directive from our state chancellor's office to um, really improve student success and to address anti-racism. And um, I also observe that participatory governance, which is a legal requirement of how we operate in the community college system, hasn't been enough of an emphasis, I'd say. And, um, and also with the pandemic and COVID-19, we're finding ourselves very isolated. And so based on all of those things, I developed uh, these uh, four priorities that I've just recently revealed. And so you can see a little bit about why I chose these four things. And um, I'm going to skip the, f the first three, and these are not necessarily in any order, but I'm working on participatory governance, anti-racism initiatives. We are developing a three-year uh, fiscal plan, forward thinking with um, contingencies for a number of uh, funding scenarios. And finally, I'm focused on community engagement. So I would like to kind of drill down a little bit here because um, this impacts you and our community. 
So we have a need for fundraising. Um, and uh, I want to focus on this because the pandemic has caused isolation and especially for our students. And we are all working remotely. The district has made a decision to continue our remote efforts through June. And so in a sense, this is no longer an emergency, but more of a lifestyle or work style. And um, I'm working on really developing relationships because I feel that if you have that trust and foundation, it helps us get through tough times and we need to support each other. And so uh, these are the things I'm looking at, how we engage. Um, I'm responsible for a President's Council, which is community members and elected officials get together and we um, talk about our fundraising efforts and our fundraising priorities and work together to roll out um, some of those efforts. And I'm having a series of town halls and meet and greets, and I have an invitation to a meet and greet that I've already planned. Um, I have a slide on this, but I think it's November 18th, where we're inviting elected officials and community members to come, where I'll share a little bit more about me personally, and we can have a dialogue, a Q&A, and um, Chancellor uh, Michael Clare is being so gracious with his time, and he will be there with me because again, I'm so new to the district, I'm still learning and he might be able to help me answer some of the district related questions. And, and so we, we already have uh, quite a, a foundation here in the community. We're embedded in the K-12 system with our dual enrollment program and a community partnership with our business leaders and civic leaders. And so I am here to continue in that vein and to you know, um, be, super full of gratitude um, for the support that the city of San Bruno has um, given Skyline College for so many years, and, um, and I want to continue with that legacy. And uh, I have a few slides on the state of the college, and I just, this is one of our data slides that I just find so fascinating, because when you, this is about our enrollment, so the, the blue line is our head count, and when you in the community college system, when you see an economic downturn, you see an inverse correlation to an increase in enrollments. And so we're seeing the increase in, in enrollments here, which makes sense. But we're seeing a decline in FTES, which is our full-time student equivalency metric. And this is related to how you get funding from the state, which means that the number of students we have coming to Skyline right now are going up. But generally speaking, Skyline uh, students are taking less uh, courses. And so I think of the orange line as the sort of pandemic effect that um, we've really never um, seen before. So I just think this is an interesting slide. Um, so COVID-19 has affected everything uh, that we do and how we do business. And we pivoted on a dime in spring to bring all of our face-to-face -face classes in an online format. And we have such an amazing, from my perspective anyway, coming in new, an emergency ops center that's second to none at the district that has been an incredible support to each of the colleges. And Skyline um, is, is offering very limited face-to-face. -face. In fact, the state requires us to offer everything online that we can offer online but these are the things that we brought face to face. We have this uh, automotive program that has outdoor bay areas. Um, we've brought some health classes and some science labs that are just mandatory that you can't do in any other way. So we're offering those in a hybrid manner with a reduced number of students coming and rotating through. Um, <clears throat> our dual enrollment program is going so strong. Um, and um, so, that really hasn't decreased during the pandemic. And we have 16 high school participants and a number of sections and students and pathways. And so this continues to grow. Um, we are um, engaged in some fundraising efforts. I'm trying to have a masquerade ball. I'm working with our emergency ops center to make sure that we, we are able to do this. But we our idea is to have everyone get dressed up and drive through and have an experience um, from the car. And so um, we're working on some very creative things and that will be, so I will be sending out save the dates for December 3rd. 
And then <clears throat> locally in the community, we have a district-wide workforce task force, um, and we've collaborated all three colleges with the district to address job loss and the short-term training opportunities that we've been offering at Skyline for those that have um, lost their jobs during the pandemic. Um, we're trying to do some rapid career uh, development and child development, hospitality, human resources, and digital design. And um, through our uh, Bay Area Entrepreneurship Center, um, we're um, giving small business assistance through grants and training, and we've ramped up our career readiness and job placement. And finally, I think what everybody is talking about right now is how we've opened our campus to a drive-through um, food distribution uh, every Wednesday from 11 to 1. And we've been at it for eight weeks, and you can see these metrics. It's just, it's just grown so quickly, and I think we're kind of um, leveling off here. And so we have served uh, in the eighth week up to 666 families, and so this is an equivalent to about 288,000 uh, uh, worth dollars worth of food that we have distributed in our community. So. That has been just an amazing um, effort with the support of our public safety and our facilities team and our Spark Point uh, group. And so here's my invitation, open invitation to get to know me a little better. So I'm hosting this meet and greet on Zoom. And um, so it's an opportunity for me to have a conversation. It's quite a bit of Q&A, more Q than A than me speaking. And then my open invitation is to contact my assistant, Teresa, if you want to meet with me or ever just want to meet one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation. I'm looking forward to developing um, my relationships with our elected officials and with the council members. And so I look forward to um, what comes next for us. We all want to thank you very much for taking your time because I know you're, like you said, your 88th day, and so you've got a lot going on, and I do appreciate, and I can say, not only on the food, you know, you, you've been up there and you volunteered, and you have your staff that is assisting as well, and so um, as, as we had spoke, uh, Skyline College has been very important to this community um, and has uh, assisted us in challenging times in fun times, and I'm sorry that we're in COVID-19 because we would uh, all go up there and, and welcome you uh, properly and appropriately, but uh, mm -hmm. next year we'll be here soon enough and I'm sure we'll be able to have that encounter. And I appreciate you reaching out to the community, uh, to the electeds, um, and uh, like I said, uh, I walked away with our conversation um, just very impressed. And um, I think Skyline College and San Bruno, like I said, uh, fortunate to have you. So again, on behalf of the council, welcome and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Now go go relax before you have to go to work on your 89th day tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's move on to item C. Thank you to San Bruno Recology for partnering with the city for the fall community cleanup event, which was held on October the 17th, which was a Saturday. And um, do we have the general manager? I am. I am here. Um, thank you for letting me take a few minutes to not only thank the city of San Bruno, but thank several of our council members and residents that actually came out to help our very first ever community cleanup event. Um, I just wanted to brag a little and provide you some stats, which I think are pretty astonishing. Um, we served over 262 cars and trucks that day for three hours. We filled eight 30-yard debris boxes, which ended up weighing 24,000 pounds. We collected over 4,200 pounds of electronic waste. And we collected 11 Gaylords, which are extremely large square boxes um, filled with paint. Um, we don't have weights on these, or I, however, I can tell you that was an extremely large amount of paint. We recycled about 15 appliances that day, and then we also followed up um, 
we kind of ran out of room towards the end and we had to turn a few people away, but we made good on our word and we served about, we did about 12 additional pickups um, on la the week following for those people that were turned away. So again, I want to thank um, Council Member Laura Davis for actually partnering with us on this very first project and it was a tremendous success. So thank you to the City of San Bruno and Jennifer's office for assisting us with permits and, and layouts and we had some community service officers that helped with traffic and I think it went very seamless. We had no issues blocking the fire department. We, we have received a lots of emails and actually phone calls from those residents thanking us for putting that together. You know, th thank you for the update, and I think what, what I learned was that the e-waste and the paint, especially the paint, were, were things that people were very happy to be able to get that uh, taken care of. So uh, as a reminder, of course, uh, folks can um, request through your office to have their twice a year at this point uh, pickups, but um, thank you for all that, and I do know that I mean, your team was there till 2.30, 3 o'clock that afternoon, uh, along with other um, folks here that are on the screen that uh, worked hard. And let me tell you, the, the weather was warm, and uh, some of the gentlemen that are on the screen really uh, worked hard. And, and then I saw Council Member Davis actually directing traffic, so uh, she, she did it all. So, um, but I want to thank you very much for helping and uh, for, for the city staff, too, that, that assisted in this endeavor. Thank you. Okay. We'll continue on. Uh, we're now going to go to item D, receive an update on COVID-19 response and efforts. And we will turn it over to Jennifer. Good evening, honorable mayor and members of the city council. We're just pulling up the presentation now. Um, so you should be able to see the cover sheet there. Uh, my name is Jennifer Diaz. I'm the assistant to the city manager. Um, looks like the clicker is just working. Okay. Okay, I am the assistant to the city manager and I'm here to represent our emergency operations center um, public information team and provide an update on COVID-19 to you. Tonight's presentation includes our county's current statistics, our new status on the blueprint for a safer economy, COVID-19 testing information, the county's Halloween guidance, and a few other resources and information. As of October 22nd, just this past Friday, the county health department reports that there are 495 positive COVID-19 cases in San Bruno. The city by city staff are released each Friday. The San Mateo County uh, data dashboard provides a snapshot of data related to COVID-19 cases in San Mateo County. In total, there are 11,198 positive cases in our county and a total of 159 deaths. 159 includes four deaths since the last report out to you earlier this month. As you know, this health data is used by the state to evaluate our containment of COVID-19 and how that applies to our status on the blueprint for a safer economy. The blueprint for a safer economy is just that. It's a blueprint or a roadmap for reducing COVID-19 in our state. It includes identified criteria for loosening and tightening restrictions on activities and business categories. For the last three weeks, the, uh, the county was in a substantial category. However, earlier today, the state of California announced that the county has now qualified to move to the orange or moderate tier of the blueprint. This change further eases restrictions on activities. Our county qualifies with 4.4 new positive cases per day per 100,000 population, 3.0 adjusted case rate, 1.6 positivity rate, and 3.7 healthy equity rate. These all fall within the moderate cat category, and counties must maintain this criteria for a minimum of two weeks before qualifying for the next less restrictive tier and vice versa. The question of the day has been, so what does that mean to San Bruno? And it actually means a lot. So first of all, it shows the transmission of COVID-19 has decreased and testing has increased. So thank you to everyone who has helped by taking the necessary precautions. 
Uh, malls and stores are allowed to open indoors with some light restrictions in common areas. Personal care services, nail and hair salons are all allowed to operate indoors. Family entertainment centers are allowed indoors at 25% capacity. Museums, zoos, and aquariums are allowed indoors at 50% capacity, as are places of worship and movie theaters. Gyms, fitness centers, and indoor pools are allowed indoors at 25% capacity. And finally, restaurants are allowed indoors at 50% capacity or 200 people, whichever is fewer. Um, previously, bars were not allowed to operate outdoors. Um, and in the moderate category, they are allowed to operate, uh, excuse me, they were not allowed to operate outdoor or indoors. And now in this new category, they're allowed to operate outdoors with modifications. And lastly, playgrounds and outdoor recreational facilities are allowed to be open. If you have questions about what is or is not allowed, the state's website, which is www.covid19.ca.gov, has information about required operational modifications and safety guidelines. And this is helpful for business owners as well as the general public in order to safely comply and continue with our progress to move forward. The data used for the blueprint for a safer economy strongly relies on testing. The county is now offering um, the county is now offering um, oral mouth swab COVID-19 testing that is self-administered for children and families in partnership with Curative Inc. Testing is open by appointment to all families that live in San Mateo County with children ages five and older. Free testing is available at the San Mateo County Event Center and appointments are available weekdays, Monday through Friday from 1 p.m. to 8, uh, 8 p.m. The easiest way to make an appointment is to connect through the county's website at smcgov.org, find the testing icon or logo, and click to find information about this and other testing sites that are available. It's important to note that individuals taking an oral test cannot eat, drink, chew gum, smoke, or vape in the 20 minutes leading up to their test. And just to give you an idea of how it works, individuals will have to cough deeply three to five times, swab their mouth for 20 seconds, insert the swab into a provided tube and secure the cap on the tube so that the swab tip is facing um, downward into the tube liquid shake it up a little bit and return it securely in a sealed bag, all completely self-administered. It's similar to the process for the locally um, administered testing sites. Local sites are part of the effort to continue to test in disadvantaged areas and to meet the newly established equity metric um, mandated by the state. And the San Bruno Emergency Operations Center is planning for a site in San Bruno, and information about the local testing site should be announced next week, so please stay tuned. Mobile testing is available in San Bruno as well. It was held earlier today and will also be held tomorrow. The testing site is available 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. and that's at 975 Pace Lane. There's a schedule on um, this slide on the screen that has additional locations within our county. Mobile testing sites are free for individuals 18 and older that live and work in San Mateo County. Appointments are required and they can be made at Project Baseline com forward slash COVID-19. I do want to note that mobile testing is through Verily and the family and local um, self-administered testing sites are all through Curative. Both are two separate testing providers and have different registration websites for appointments. So all of them are available on the county site um, and that will serve as a centralized landing page for testing information. So why is testing important? Being tested for COVID-19 may help limit the spread of COVID-19 to family um, and others in our community. Testing plays a key role in determining what business categories are permitted to be open, helps us return to work and everyday life safely. And in addition to testing, preventative safety measures are important. And so I know we have all heard this many times, but social distancing and masks are critical as we progress. Um, for those who do not have a mask, the county has a community crew mask mo um, uh, mobile, and that mobile drives around to distribute free masks. If you see the mask mobile, feel free to stop by. It's made its way to our area a couple of times along with Millbrae. Um, but please do remember to respect the space amongst other visitors visiting the mobile, especially if you do not already have a mask on. 
Halloween is this weekend, and this year we'll have to celebrate in a slightly different way. Um, this is a reminder and information. Uh, San Mateo County Health issued a guidance for Halloween and Dia de los Muertos. Please avoid high-risk activities that are not permitted, that's gatherings, events, and parties with non-household members, carnivals, festivals, live entertainment. Um, it's just a way to be creative on how you celebrate the holiday. I mean, you can host a virtual costume or pumpkin carving party, wear a mask if you go out, watch a movie uh, with people that you live with. All of this information and, and several more ideas are all available on the county's website, and you can get to that linking on this page or going to smchealth.org. It is important to note that the change to the moderate tier on the blueprint for a safer economy does not affect this holiday guidance. With the year quickly coming to an end and the holidays um, and additional holidays on the horizon, we'll all have to keep in mind this year it's going to be different than years past, and we'll just have to adjust in order to keep ourselves, our families, and our community safer. Um, next, I'll go over a few resources available to our community. For those that are in need of food assistance, there are several options that are available. Great Place Delivered is a program that delivers nutritious daily meals. It's a program for adults 65 and older and other eligible residents. This deadline uh, for the program has been extended a couple times and has most recently been extended through November 7th. Um, and the county has typically made a commitment to continue that through the end of the month. There are several other options for food assistance, including free meal distribution sites for school children, Second Harvest Food Bank, and CalFresh. Information about these programs and others can all be found at smcgov.org forward slash food. For local businesses and um, following our new um, Skyline president, the Bay Area Entrepreneur Center and Skyline College, along with several other partners, are hosting the Small Business Symposium, and that's titled Lessons in Adapting. The symposium will be held this upcoming weekend. It's October 31st through November 2nd and will include the exploration of challenges that small businesses face in navigating the impact of this pandemic. The symposium will feature small business owners, local experts, and community leaders all sharing their insights and advice uh, on how to move forward. More information about the symposium is available through the BAEC, and that website is skylinebaec.org. Um, next, I have the COVID-19 safety guidelines for vote centers. So many people will be busy voting um, through the next week or so. Those that are out and at vote centers through election days, please remember to adhere to all of the established safety guidelines. Um, these were pulled from the election site. Uh, wear a face covering or face mask over your nose and mouth. Maintain physical distance of six feet from others. Use the hand sanitizer that will be on site. Vote using single-use style or finger cot. And lastly, you can use the ballot draw by 8 p.m. on election day. You do not want to visit a vote center uh, directly. And lastly, uh, please stay connected. Make sure that you and your family are registered for SMC Alert. It's SMC Alert is the emergency notification system that we use during the time of an emergency. You can sign up by, by, by visiting our website at sambruno.ca.gov. Please also be sure to follow us on social media. And with that, Mr. Mayor, it concludes my presentation for this evening, and I appreciate um, any questions that you may have. Thank you for the information and uh, presentation, Jennifer. Appreciate it. And we'll go ahead. Hey, Chair. Uh, Councilmember Davis. So Halloween, I'm starting to hear lots of questions about the little trick-or-treaters. Um, I guess the message should be getting out that kids shouldn't really be trick-or-treating. I mean, I know they've come up with some unique ways with sending candy through a tube uh, down into the sidewalk, but I, I would assume that's the message we're trying to get across. So no trick-or-treating, try to stay home and do family fun things. the guidance um, distributed through social media, we do also have a reminder post that is scheduled to go out later this week, and we will be putting that out through all of our platforms. Thanks so much. Uh, Council Member Mason. Right, thanks, and I, I, I was hoping that one of those um, could be also some of the local schools are hosting trunk or treats 
Um, so I was hoping that maybe they could, uh, the city manager can get in contact with the superintendent and make sure that the guidelines are being followed. Yes, yes, Council Member Mason. Uh, we do know that, and trunk or treats are not recommended. And uh, we are reaching out to the school district to inform them of that, and hopefully there can be a modification made. That would be great. Thank you. Um, and then my other question is in regards to um, an update on the um, uh, emergency funds that were approved at the onset of COVID and when we would get the next update on where we are without those funds. Yes, Council Member. Uh, that is due to the Council at your very next meeting when we do the uh, Q1 update for the first quarter, July, August, September, and uh, that report will be coming to you at your next meeting. Great. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you, Jennifer. Let's move on to item E. Uh, receive annual report from the Culture and Arts Commission. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, phew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me, and now my screen size changed. Sorry, hold on. So I can see my notes. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Melissa Rolfs, and I'm the Chair of the Culture and Arts Commission. I'm pleased to present to you the Culture and Arts Commission's 2019-2020 annual report. This evening's agenda will include the Commission's members, the purpose of the Commission, the Commission's accomplishments for the year, and our goals for next year. At the end of the presentation, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Next slide, please. The Culture and Arts Commission consists of seven commissioners. Myself, Melissa Rolfs, Chair, Pamela Gamble, Vice Chair, Jean George, Pamela Madden, Janet Monahan, Judith Puccini, and Melody Tobin. Um, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Anyone is welcome to email the commission, um, the commission members at cultureandarts at sambruno.ca.gov. Next slide, please. The commission is responsible for promoting artistic development of the community, preserving San Bruno's diverse cultural heritage, acquiring and maintaining public art, sponsoring programs and events that enhance the quality of life, and improving the image and character of our community. Some of the commission's events had to be canceled this year due to COVID-19. These included Movies in the Park and the Children's Art Project at Community Day in the Park. However, the Commission was able to achieve a number of accomplishments in spite of the pandemic. These include the installation of traffic signal controller boxes, um, sorry, traffic signal controller box artwork, Shakespeare in Park, the Library Art Gallery program continued, and then re the recommendation of relocating Memorial Recognition Sculpture in City Park and creating and installing a city art map on the Commission's webpage. Now let's look at these accomplishments in more detail. Artwork was completed, as you can see from the slide, artwork was completed and installed in three traffic signal controller boxes. Each box was assigned a theme. The education theme box is located at Sharp Park Road and Pacific Heights Boulevard. The patriotism themed box is located at San Mateo Avenue and Huntington Avenue. And the Mission Bells theme box is located at Sneath Lane and Seabiscuit Avenue. These three boxes mark the completion of this project. The Commission is now in the midst of determining if it would like to proceed with a new set of boxes, and if so, how it would like to proceed. Exactly one year ago, exactly one year ago today, the Commission sponsored Shakespeare in the Park. The play that, um, the play that was performed was Hamlet, and it was, the performance was by the San Francisco Shakespeare Festival. The Commission has sponsored Shakespeare in Park for the past several years, and last year we had a record attendance of 102 residents. We're looking forward to holding Shakespeare in the Park again in 2021. Next slide, please. The Commission selected three artists for the library's art gallery program. Artworks for this round of the program were on display from July 2019 until the library closed in March of this year due to COVID. We look forward to hosting new artworks whenever the library does reopen. Next slide, please. The commission also recommended relocating the Memorial Recognition Sculpture in City Park. 
As you may recall, the sculpture must be relocated because its current location is within the footprint of the new Recreation and Aquatic Center. The new location will be near the west end of the tennis courts. This project is scheduled to be completed by Thanksgiving. And finally, an art map was recently created and installed on the Commission's webpage. This map lets users click on a location and see a photo and a description of the art that the Commission initiated. Users can also go directly to the art map at sanbruno.ca.gov forward slash art map. Next slide, please. We have several goals for 2020-2021. The City Art Fund does have a balance, um, sorry, the City Art Fund currently has a balance of $338,911, so we're in um, a healthy financial position. We will continue to work with the Parks and Recreation Commission to establish an art presence at the new Recreation and Aquatic Center. We plan to restart the library gallery exhibit program when the library reopens. And the Commission plans to sponsor the Children's Art Project in conjunction with the Posey Parade and Community Day in the Park. Continuing with the Commission's goals, we plan to return to holding movies in the park next September. And then we will present Shakespeare in the Park once again in October 2021. We also plan to host the 2020 Narita International Children's Exhibit artwork in the children's room of the library as soon as the library reopens. Finally, we will continue to develop the Commission's vision for future art projects. A moment ago, I mentioned the Narita Japan artwork at the library. Here is an example of the artwork from that exhibit. This piece was drawn by a second grade Narita student. This year's theme was sports in anticipation of the Tokyo Summer Olympics, which have now been postponed until next year. This concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the presentation. Um, any questions from colleagues? Uh, Councilmember Medina. Yes, um, I just wanted to uh, commend the artwork that it has popped up around the city. It's really wonderful, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. I love how you guys uh, went ahead and put that art map. I just found out about that today, so I think that's great. And looking forward to uh, much more art in San Bruno. So thank you for your work. Thank you for that. I'll be sure to, pair up to pass that along to my uh, co-commissioners. Um, we're, we're pleased. <laughs> So thank you for noticing. <laughs> okay, uh, if nothing else, uh, Councilmember Mason. Hi, Melissa. I just wanted to thank you for the presentation. Uh, I love the utility boxes that are popping up all around the city. Um, I did want to ask if there's any uh, work being done right now around uh, like a, a downtown mural of any kind and whether that's uh, something that's been asked for in the past. That's a great question. Um, there's nothing being planned. There, I should say there's nothing finalized. There's certainly been talk. We even did a walking tour through downtown San Bruno to um, identify locations that could be suitable for it. But um, those conversations really, we really have only had, you know, like all the other commission meetings, they went on hold for a while, so it just slowed everything down. So there's certainly conversation around it, but there's nothing finalized. It's something that we, I, I can tell you that we've had um, requests and interest from members of the community around this idea of a mural. So there's certainly interest, and it's one of the things that we plan to explore um, in this coming year too, 2020, 2021. Thank you. And and just one other question is, um, I, I saw that you're doing the art in the library. Um, yes. are, is that aligned with the library um, when they focus like on, because someone had a commented on the fact that there was like a women's right month, but then there wasn't a whole lot of art for Black History Month in February. And so I'm wondering if there's work going on around that for the, on the, cult, the cultural side of the Art and Culture Committee to work with the library around the, that area. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. So are you, are you asking if the art is aligned to cultural sensitivities? I'm missing something. 
Yeah, is the art aligned to not just cultural sensitivities, but is the Arts and Culture Committee working with the library around specific focus, um, but like I guess focus months, I would say, when they're celebrating certain events? Okay, I see. We have not up until this point, but it's a great suggestion, and I'll bring it back to them. Um, we very much, it's very much driven by the artists that submit their art to the review process to be considered. We, I, I can tell you that the commissioners and then the library staff that support us have been really involved in, in like, I don't know if soliciting is the right word, but certainly putting out feelers to people in the artistic community, inviting them to, to um, apply. Okay. Uh, so I, I like the idea. We have, so it's a long way of saying we have not approached, the commission has not approached the library to, to collaborate in that sense around themes that are, you know, that are timely. Um, but I will also bring that back to my fellow commissioners because it's a really good idea. Great, thank you. And once again, uh, Melissa, thank you very much for your presentation. Please pass on from all of us our thanks and appreciation, uh, even in these COVID times, uh, making progress and uh, being here, we appreciate it. All right, we will then move on to um, consent. We have several items. Uh, all items are considered routine or implementation at an earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested. Are there any items that um, council wants to have a separate vote on? Let's see. Is there any uh, item that uh, council wants to have uh, questions or additional information on? Yes. Uh, council, uh, council Member Davis and Council Member Mason. Uh, item five uh, D. Sorry, five D. D is in, yeah. Okay. D. D is in dog. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Council Member Mason. Yeah, I, I have a couple questions on A, uh, C. Um, C. Council Member Davis already mentioned E. And, uh, and I. Okay. Uh, Councilor Medina. Just a recognition of the, uh, the resignation in the uh, bike pedestrian. Thank you. Okay. So why don't we, uh, we'll start from the top. Uh, item A, accept accounts payable of October 12th and 19th, 2020. Race. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to ask about the uh, services that are being offered by Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center um, and Star Vista. I wasn't sure if those are tied to, I know Star Vista offers some uh, activities at the library, but it would be great to know what that money is going towards. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, City Council, Javon Grogan, City Manager. Uh, with regard to that question, uh, let's take the first one. So there's a $10,000 payment to Peninsula Conflict Resolution. Uh, the city contracts with Peninsula Conflict Resolution each year, uh, and what they do on our behalf is they engage with typically neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conflicts, uh, oftentimes a code enforcement issue will trigger what is actually a private property issue between uh, two neighbors. And the city is, uh, oftentimes is not the solution to that problem. And so we contract with Peninsula Conflict Resolution to meet with the two homeowners and help them work out a amicable, amicable resolution that hopefully does not involve uh, neighbors suing each other. And so there are a number of uh, uh, members in the community that take advantage of that service uh, each year and it's, um, it, it costs $10,000 for that. They also uh, provide other mediation services to the city uh, on a periodic basis and even some training, I believe. Uh, with regard to Star Vista, that is our uh, annual contribution to Star Vista. I do not have the specific uh, scope of work on what they provide to the city, but we can provide that to the city council in an off agenda memo. Uh, and so, but that invoice was for $18,000. Unfortunately, I just don't have that handy right now. Okay, that would be great to know. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mayor. That's it for the, for the question and um, the warrant. Thanks. Um, let's move on to item um, B, introduce newly appointed. Oh, oh, what am I doing? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I went backwards. Uh, item C, adopt resolution authorizing the city manager to accept and consent to the deeds with grants conveying a right of way or an easement for public use. So, Mike, um, thank you for bringing this to our attention um, for a vote. Uh, my question is really around what is the scope of the authorization that we're providing to the city manager and that's giving up by the council? Are, are we just saying this is, an e this is easier to handle procedurally? It's 10 hours of staff time per, I believe it was per request, something along those lines in the staff report, and we're just giving to the city manager, or are there additional um, negotiating points that we're also giving to the city manager that we wouldn't be talking about publicly? I'd be happy to answer that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Please, city attorney. Of course. So um, the, the, the short answer is that there is no authority being granted to the city manager that involves a, a grant of fee title to property. And the important thing about that is that the only authority that's given is it's not because it's uh, it's routine or um, you know it's less time consuming. Uh, that, that that is a reason, but the main reason is that those grants of easements and rights of way are um, often not determined until after the project is already approved and the city council has already has already made its action on it. And so the authority is really just limited to those rights of way and access easements that end up being necessary because of how the project is configured. And these are situations in which the developer or the property owner is giving the city that easement or right of way, say for pedestrians or for cars to cross a driveway. Um, we had one in the aperture project where uh, access was required to a disabled ramp. So these are things that really there's no policy question about. Um, unlike a situation where there's an interest in fee title that the city is receiving. So that's the reason why we're recommending this. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure. Does, will that then, the decision made by the city manager, will it then trigger anything else on the, that, that then becomes the responsibility of the city, such as maintenance, infrastructure, et cetera? by approving, you know, one of these conveyances? Um, so to, to the extent that there is an easement for public access, then the answer could be yes. Um, but that was public access that the city should be providing in the first place. So the, the only reason why we're getting it from the property owner is because we need to provide it. So it's really not creating any additional responsibility or liability that the city wouldn't ordinarily be assuming in the first place. Okay, help, and helpful. And just um, for the, the staff report does suggest one of the benefits is the staff time. And so I, that's why. That's I, why that's, so thank yes, you. That, of course, that's that's true. And there is a benefit there. It's not the primary one, um, but, but it is important. And we're, we'd be certainly recommending that the city council consider approving it. Okay, understood. Thank you. Okay, not seeing any hands. I'm going to go move on to item D. Adopt resolution. Adopt a resolution of the city council uh, approving the application for statewide park development and community revitalization program grant funds. Member David. Oh, was that you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask the city attorney if I should be involved with this discussion being that I live within 500 feet of the park. Sorry, my video wasn't working. <laughs> um, I apologize. Um, yes, you know, that, that did not occur to us before when the agenda was, was posted. Um, you can certainly indicate your recusal from that matter when the vote is taken. I think if there's only a a question about it, you can certainly remain on the, on the dais, assuming there's no discussion. Okay, I'll wait. Um, I, I think there's going to be a question, so I think there's going to be a discussion, so I probably should recuse myself now. Fair enough. All right. So I'm going to
going to leave the room, all right? All right. Don't go too far. Um, okay, Council Member Davis, I believe you asked for this item? Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for bringing this forward, and thank you for, of course, as many um, projects we have submitted some grant, grant requests for. I guess the fiscal impact is what kind of jumped out at me where we're looking at an estimated cost, cost of 1.7, um, which originally was 1.1. So what's the change in the increase by 600,000? To the chair, Audrey Jones Taylor, good evening. Good evening. So I can't really tell you except for the contingencies and where we are right now. And so the 1.7 actually is what we are going to, well, we're going to be requesting 1.6 from the state um, of California revitalization program. And although the design has not changed significantly, but certainly over the last period of submitting the request and um, things have, have changed, not in terms of the design, but certainly in terms of the amount of contingencies that everyone is trying to co um, cover now, including COVID contingency. And so we're playing it more on the safe side than on, um, on than not. One of the other things I just want to bring to your attention is that although the deadline is on December the 14th, the grant award, if we are awarded, will not happen until the summer of 2021. And it'll probably take about three to anywhere six months for the award to actually be um, passed on to the city. So we're not really looking at being able to start and probably until the first of the year in 2022. So we are playing more on the safe side and ensuring that we do have enough money to cover um, the park. Great, thank you so much. Through um, the chair, if I can just bounce on that. Um, it's important to note that the project uh, was defunded by 1.1 due to budget constraints, but at that time, the project was also underfunded. And so it wouldn't be fair to sort of say that the full cost increase is 600,000 from then to now. Um, because even at that time, there was not enough money in the fund to build the entire project. Just wanted to make that clarification so no one walks away with that um, uh, impression. Yeah, and, and if I remember correctly, there was some sort of design issues that were originally um, approved, and then they had to come back and say, well, we need to, this is accurate, and we're going to need to do some additional things. So I'm assuming there's, a, there's definitely a couple hundred in there for some of that. Thank you. Council Member Mason. Yeah, so I know one of the priorities that was said was a grant, so I want to first thank staff for um, – applying for these grant funds since we don't have money it may be the best way to get Florida Park built um, I did just want to ask if the if the grant if it's possible that they're going to actually give partial money as opposed to the full grant and what the possibilities of that happening are well, that's kind of hard to say they certainly can it's the choice of theirs I do believe that since this project has been out there and last round, around three, San Bruno did a pretty good job. It was just a little bit more competitive. And I think the state has been really good about um, telling us where we were weak at. And so we're really working hard. So I don't see we're not promised. Any, nothing is promised to us. But I am looking forward to having the um, project totally funded. Okay, thank but you. But there is a possibility of you know, having, receiving partial funding. In that case, we also are, well, I am partially also looking at other opportunities in grant funding and um, partnerships. Okay. Yeah, um, Manager uh, Grogan has been telling you that you've been working on this, Audrey, um, to make our application as competitive as possible for the last couple of months. So I really appreciate the work, and hopefully we get the money. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, let's um, oh, let's uh, bring Councilmember uh, Medina back. Uh, just appears. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to item E. Uh, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a general services agreement with Northern Services Inc. for the police department. Eight back. 
replacement project in the amount of $198,050. There's also approving a construction contingency and approving a total budget in the amount of $227,050. Council member, Mason. Okay, great, thank you. So my question um, around this is really just around the where the police is housed right now. There, I know that there have been discussions, and I don't know how um, cemented they are, but that it's possible the police may move at some point and, and need to find a, a new home. Um, and so the reason I say that is because this is a substantial amount to invest um, if, if we're not sure what the, the future of that particular location is. And my understanding of HVAC systems is that they're not that cheap to move, and they're not that easy to move, especially if there's any bend in the wiring. So uh, whoever would like to take that on would be great. Thank you. Um, Council Member Mason, uh, why don't I provide a response for, for that? Uh, what you're referring to is I, I think there has long been uh, speculation that at some point there would be a significant investment in Tan Fran to redo the rear entrance. Uh, and if you look at that rear entrance near the movie theater, um, it uh, was enhanced. Uh, and there is a vision to have uh, a different environment leading from the BART station uh, into the mall. When this project was first talked about almost uh, a year and a half now, we had approached the owners of the mall and asked them how far uh, any potential uh, investment uh, in that area of the mall uh, would be. The answer there is potentially five years away, even if they've begun today, given how long the entitlement process and construction uh, process takes. In addition, the largest challenge with um, a plan to where the mall or some other property owner would relocate our location is that we currently have approximately $9 million of debt on that facility that is paid for by our former redevelopment agency. So should uh, someone want to relocate the police station, they would have to assume that $9 million of debt and uh, potentially purchase land and or build us, and build us a new police station. Uh, and so you're increasing whatever that cost is by $9 million. And so uh, will that happen in the future? Uh, right, we don't know, but what we certainly know is that the roof has had significant leaks over the, the past few years um, and is in very much need of improvement as well as our HVAC system. And so in the capital improvement budget for this year, the city council approved a project for the police station uh, that includes both the HVAC replacement and the roof replacement. This is phase one of that project, replacing the HVAC. Okay. Um, in a perfect world, is that only a five-year investment? Potentially, I would say it's likely more a 10 plus year investment given the um, amount of investment and renovations that would have to occur at the mall site for someone to undertake the expense of paying off the current debt and uh, providing the city with a new lease station. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, if nothing else, we will move on to item F. Uh, accept the resignation from Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee member, effective October 14, 2020, and direct the city clerk to post note of a vacancy in accordance with state law. I just wanted to, uh, anytime we have a, a resignation, I think it's great that we just publicly state and thank, uh, thank them. So I'd like to thank Henry Marr for his service and wish him the best on whatever he's pursuing. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to item I, adopt a resolution uh, appropriate 120000 from the general fund for well, and staff um, services to advance the work program of the community and economic development department. I, I apologize. I actually just uh, looked at my notes when I read the staff report, and I, I've answered my own question. My own question. Thank you. Okay, those are the best. All right, so um, we've gone through all of the items. Um, we can uh, do one motion uh, with the caveat that Council Member Medina will recuse, be recused from um, the one item, which was um, D. E. E. E for dog. Yep. So, 
things. Uh, is it action by council? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Mason? Aye. Council Member Manita? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Okay. Now, thank you. And now we'll move on to uh, public hearings. Item 6A, hold a public hearing regarding an economic development subsidy report pursuant to Government Code Section 53083, adopt a resolution accepting the report and authorizing the city manager to execute a tax sharing participation agreement with Walmart.com USA LLC. City manager. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. So, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, members of City Council, and members of the public, Javon Grogan, City Manager. Uh, tonight, uh, this public hearing uh, and action uh, is, uh, will be jointly presented to you by myself and City Attorney Mark Zafferano. Uh, the, the action that's requested of the City Council is to accept the report and authorize the City Manager to enter into a tax-sharing participation, participation agreement with Walmart.com. So what is the benefits uh, to this agreement for the city? First, uh, it's important to know it achieves uh, two of our Im important economic development goals. One for business expansion, uh, Walmart.com uh, is investing in their headquarters here in the city of San Bruno and uh, business uh, retention. It also improves the city's fiscal sustainability uh, in providing uh, approximately $3.6 million to the city uh, for a 25 year period uh, annually. In addition, it accomplishes the goal of having direct community benefits uh, to the city, uh, really as a reflection of the impact that business expansion has on our community. The agenda tonight will we'll first provide a background. We'll review uh, the proposed features of the agreement. Uh, we will hold the public hearing on the, for the required economic development subsidy report. And then we will be asking the city council to both accept the report and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement. A little bit of background on Walmart.com. Uh, and so Walmart.com is headquartered in San Bruno. Uh, they have been headquartered here since they uh, moved here in 2012. They purchased their facility at 850 Cary Avenue uh, for a total of $821 million in 2014. Uh, it is a 271 square foot facility. Uh, it employs, they, here in San Bruno, they employ just over 2,000 employees. They are uh, one of two of our largest employers. And so uh, the, our two largest employers are YouTube and Walmart.com. Uh, each of them employ approximately 2,000 employees. Uh, they own the building uh, and they are currently for, performing tenant improvements, approximately $20 million of improvements uh, that they are uh, actively underway uh, at the 850 Cherry Avenue building. They sell in uh, Walmart.com, as we all know, they sell inventory owned by Walmart on various platforms and uh, that merchandise is shipped throughout the state of California. Uh, and through this agreement, we are seeking to designate San Bruno as the point of sale for all online transactions. The result of which is the city of San Bruno will receive uh, the, our local 1% sales tax when uh, an online transaction occurs and is delivered anywhere in the state of California. Uh, and so it's important to note that we will also be receiving uh, that 1%, but our local schools, uh, both uh, county uh, and our local school district, will uh, receive additional um, revenue as well because they share in, in, in the sales tax allocation. Uh, once again, uh, we talked about this at our prior meeting, uh, but the city receives a 1% allocation uh, for the statewide sales tax that here in San Bruno is 9.75%. Uh, sales tax is our second largest revenue source in the general fund. Uh, our total sales tax revenue in the adopted budget this year is 
$5 million. And so through this agreement, we are increasing that amount by more than 50%, uh, a, a very significant amount uh, of increase for our second largest general fund revenue source. Uh, our sales tax currently represents 13% of the general fund budget. Uh, and as we all know, sales tax uh, is declining this year as a result of COVID-19 and retail store closures. Uh, important to note, uh, I, I know the council knows this, but in the prior fiscal year, we received $7.9 million uh, uh, in total sales tax revenue to the general fund. And so that is the pre-COVID-19 number, nearly $8 million. This year, the number is $6.5 million. So uh, more than a 1.5% reduction in our sales tax due to COVID-19. Uh, and now I will turn the presentation over to Mark Zapparano, our city attorney, that will provide a little background on the landscape for how sales tax has changed due to uh, poor decisions. Uh, Mark? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. You have seen uh, this in some of the subsequent slides before, but just to recap, uh, there were a couple of changes in um, the law that triggered uh, Walmart's reevaluation of their California operations and e-commerce sales to designate San Bruno as the point of sale. There's a 2018 decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, the, the Wayfair decision is how it's referred to, and then also in, in 2019, more recently, this California law called the Marketplace Facilitator Act, uh, which refers to online platforms remitting sales tax on sales by remote sellers. So the combination of those, those two legal decisions and uh, operational decisions by Walmart, um, they, uh, they determined that San Bruno should be designated as the point of sale for Walmart.com transactions. If you could go to the next slide, that would be great. So uh, as we told you last time, the city did review uh, over a dozen other agreements throughout the state of California. They seemed to average um, about 15 to 19 years in term and about 50% revenue sharing between the city and the business. Next slide, please. The main features of this agreement, as we reported on, uh, there's been no, uh, no substantive change from the last time, uh, is that uh, the city will receive about 58% overall of, of the total tax over a 25-year term. And so the total tax is a little over $6 million. The city will receive, uh, you'll see on the next slide, a share that's about 58% of that. Um, this does not affect the Measure G sales tax allocation that comes to the city, uh, irrespective of this particular agreement. And so on the next slide, you see the uh, breakdown of the 6.2 million, again, the same slide. As you saw last time with the city receiving 3.625 in the first year and in subsequent years, if the amount remains the same. Of course, the amount could go up or down, uh, but the percentage is, uh, is what it is. And uh, so the agreement is in effect for, uh, for 25 years, assuming, of course, Walmart uh, stays in the city. Next slide. So we have a couple of actions tonight. Uh, the first one is to open the public hearing, uh, take a testimony, and then close the public hearing on this economic development subsidy report. And let me just pause for, for one second and talk to the city council very briefly about what that report is and why it's included in your staff packet. So the government code does require this type of report, and it also specifies what needs to be in the report. And so uh, the city manager in his presentation has actually touched on all of the aspects uh, of the report that are benefit the city and why the economic subsidy for development purposes is important. Uh, the report requires that we describe the agreement. We did that. It describes the public purpose for the agreement. The city manager did that very well. In his first couple of slides, especially important for the city to revitalize its economy uh, in light of the decline of brick and mortar stores uh, and a variety of other factors, the revitalization of Bay Hill by a variety of businesses. So all of these things are substantial benefits that inure to the city in the agreement. So those are all in the economic development city report that's included in your staff packet. So uh, tonight's actions then to recap are to hold a public hearing and then um, adopt a resolution that staff is recommending to accept the report. And then the same resolution also authorizes the city manager to enter into the participation agreement 
that's attached to your packet. So that concludes my presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, with Council's permission, it is a public hearing, so why don't we begin by opening the public hearing and seeing if there's any uh, persons wishing to speak on this item. I currently don't see any hands raised. Okay. Um, once we close the public hearing, then uh, therefore uh, it will be come back to the council for uh, discussion and or action. Um, any motion in regards to closing the public hearing, please? So moved. So moved. Yes, uh, um, and, and this, I'm understanding, is still city attorney. We can take a, a voice uh, vote on this one. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, this is for closing the public hearing. The mo motion made and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? By vote. Okay. Let's bring it back to council um, for questions, comments. some 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 good news a um, couple questions the consequences of of Walmart breaking the agreement let's say X amount of years from now for whatever reason they either choose to move or, or something what what happens at that point? so I'd be happy to answer that through through the chair mr. mayor so the agreement does contain a provision that we negotiated that prohibits Walmart from soliciting or entering into another similar tax sharing agreement with another locality for up to five years. We were mostly concerned that um, we, we didn't want a situation where Walmart could leave for the purpose of negotiating a different agreement somewhere else, or there would be at least a disincentive to that. We, of course, understand that any company can decide to leave the city whenever they want. We can't make them stay. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that if they do leave, it's it's not because uh, of, of a better tax sharing agreement somewhere else. And that's for five years. So they, we pretty much, they're going to be here for five years. We can kind of almost count on that. I We certainly hope so. I mean, optimistically. Um, during, during the presentation, um, I heard when the, the, the sale when the sales are in California so when Walmart sells across the country if not the world I would think so any sales that were in Nevada that would that would, how does that work that just not included in the state law right so th this agreement covers sales tax that is owed uh, to the state of California okay um, and the last question was was um, about the twenty million in improvements. Um, just curious, what are they doing at the property? That's twenty million dollars improvements. It seems pretty substantial. City uh, manager, so various uh, tenant improvements uh, on every floor. Uh, they appear to be going floor by floor, uh, making uh, changes to. Uh, office spaces and um, um, employee common areas. What I would say is that uh, this work was, was planned uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, and they're uh, committed to doing that work and it is still ongoing. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have the full scope of work in front of me, but um, it is a significant investment in their headquarters uh, that they have been planning for quite some time. Thank you. Anyone else, Council? Chair. Uh, Vice Mayor Salazar. Thank you. So, so I just wanted to clarify a point that essentially what we're talking about is a tax break to this to this company. And I know that's one of those things that, that gets often criticized uh, by the public for, you know, this is a huge corporation and why should San Bruno agree to a tax break? And so I just, what, what I wanted to put out there was, 
or, or at least clarify is that uh, Walmart had the option to pay their state tax in any locality of their choice. Their headquarters happens to be here, but they could have picked another headquarters location and said, that's where we want to pay tax. And so the city does have a vested interest in keeping their headquarters here and keeping their sales based here. And um, if we were to say, no, uh, we don't want to give you a tax break, they could just as easily say, okay, then we will set up shop elsewhere and that's where we'll pay our taxes and possibly get a, a better deal from them. So um, I, I wanted to put that out there just because, you know, I, I've seen some things, some, some commentary made on, on social media about, you know, the city and uh, us not making smart decisions and uh, perhaps not getting a deal. But in, in my opinion, this is a very good deal for the city. And I think that it does make sense for us to go and enter into this contract. And, um, and I think Walmart was um, uh, uh, very generous in, in picking um, th their location here. I know that uh, they, they paid already pay more taxes than they previously used to when they were in, in Brisbane. And in addition to that, they were willing to negotiate this. And so um, I, I wanted to make that statement because uh, I wanted it at least to be on the record that uh, we do understand what we're getting into. And I, I personally believe that this is a very good deal for the city. So that, that was it, just a comment. Okay, thank you. Councilman Mason. Mason. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Council Member Davis. Yeah, no, I was just going to say I, I hope that uh, our city attorney concurs with Michael's comments because I'm I'm glad he said something and I'm glad he so eloquently explained that. But I think that's an important thing that it for those who are watching or listening should understand. If, if I may, through the chair, Mr. Mayor, Please. I. I, I do concur. I think there's also one thing that sometimes gets lost in those discussions, and, and that is that uh, some members of the uh, public might feel that agreements like these, these are, are unfair when they're pitting cities against each other, and it's sort of a race to the bottom about who's going who's gonna to give them the biggest break. And that's actually not the case here. Uh, Walmart.com has been here consistently for, you know, for 10 years now. Um, and they made it clear in the negotiations that that we were, uh, you know, they, they have a commitment to being in San Bruno as evidenced by their presence here for a long time. So this is not one of those situations that sometimes garners a lot of public attention uh, because cities are competing against each other uh, to bring in the business. That That's not the case here. It was not, uh, not the situation. Excellent point, Mark. Thanks. Councilman Mason. Yeah, I, and I would I would uh, also say that based on the last report that was given, um, they're actually giving San Bruno more than some of the other um, city agreements that are similar. So I actually think that the city that's really in need of funds is in a in a better position now with this agreement once once it's signed than it would be before. So um, I just wanted to say I concur, and I want to see a signed agreement before I get too excited. Thank you. And uh, I just won't repeat, but again, thanks to, to staff for, for your efforts and uh, bringing this forward to us this evening. Um, seeing no other um, comments from council, uh, this is for a resolution. Any action? Motion to approve. I'll second. <laughs> second. Everybody's on whoever. Okay. We have a motion made and a second. Oh, well, let's see, quick, I'll work that one out. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Mason. Aye. Councilmember Bina. Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Motion carried. Mr. City Attorney, is that all that you need on this topic? Thank you very much. Yes, it is. Thank you. And thank you again to both, uh, both of you and uh, City Manager. You're all welcome. Right. Let's move on to item number seven, comments from council members. Uh, to the chair. No, oh, Councilmember Davis. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody who was at um, Saturday's event for the call, fall, fall cleanup. Uh, <laughs> it was a very physical, very tiring event. Um, 
And I know that I will be leaving my seat at some point, but I really want to encourage the council members here today to, to continue this program. I think it was a really well beneficial program for the community. Um, it encouraged people to get out and clean their, their, their uh, garages and, and maybe really get rid of some, some things they shouldn't be around. Um, the paint cans that we saw were a tremendous amount of those, and, and you really don't need those leave, leave, staying around the house. So um, I hope somebody takes it on next year, and I um, really just think uh, there were some few things we could do better, but I think for the first run in it, kudos to everybody. Um, and I want to also thank uh, Stephen Seymour, who was out participating, Tom Hamilton, who was out participating, um, uh, my family, who was out there participating, and all those others uh, I know Christina Gaines, and um, they're just, the, the list kind of goes on. Zidane, who who's recently was appointed, it was just a great community event, and the thing that I heard was, let me know next time, I would love to help. And and so that was a feel good, and I think um, that one of the things we can do is really offer some more things that we can bring the community together, because everybody feels good about giving back. And so thank you to the other council members who I've seen out there um, cleaning up different parts of the city, um, it's it's catchy and it's good to see people doing that because it really makes you feel good about your city and you have pride. So thank you so much. Council Member Medina. Uh, well said, uh, Council Member Davis. It was uh, I know I was pretty sore the next day, um, and also uh, to our city manager, uh, I didn't realize he could lift like a washer or dryer by himself. So it was really impressive to see that uh, force uh, in action. So um, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on that, and I, and I think that the council will move forward with this. That's just because it was such an obviously a great event, um, a needed event, and we're going to tweak the little things to make it better. And for people that didn't make it, you know, we're sorry, just that everything was full and we were absolutely exhausted. Um, so we'll improve that. Um, I wanted to um, thank someone else who, who's helped out with our community and cleaning up, and that's Riley Gibbons. Um, he's organized two uh, community cleanups uh, in the past few months, and um, it's fantastic. It's, it's In one way, it's sad that we actually have to have cleanups because people are just kind of trashing our city, but to just not do anything and just wait, that gets us nowhere. So um, there was a great group, uh, close to 30 people showed up at the last one, and I'm looking forward to the next one. And, uh, you know, it's great when we can all get together and, 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 and do things to improve our city. So uh, thank you, Riley, for organizing. It's, uh, it's awesome. You did a great job. Anyone else from council? Councilmember Mason, did you? Yeah, no, I just wanted to echo the sentiments. Um, thank you to the council members who attended the, um, the October 17th event. I was not able to attend, but I've heard nothing but great things about it. Um, the event hosted by Riley Gibbons uh, in September and October seems to be growing double the amount of people that were there the month before. So I think it's exciting. Maybe this idea of just cleaning up during a pandemic is catching on. People have an excuse to get out of the house. Um, I did want to also thank the Girl Scouts. They invited me uh, on the morning of uh, October 17th to go and talk about governance because the girls were earning their governance badge. Um, so I had a really nice morning talking about what it's like to be on the city council um, and what San Bruno is doing. And there was so much excitement by these girls, uh, as I tell my fellow council members in the public around the aquatic center. So um, it was really just a joy to share all the all the good things that are happening in San Bruno. Um, and then I just wanted to also ask a question. Sorry to end it with a question, but um, with everything going on with the pandemic, um, it kind of has uh, the question has arisen um, that library used to host these lawyers in the library once a month. Um, and I don't know how possible this is now that we know we're going to be in this for a couple months, but some people depend on the free um, lawyer services. 
Um, and I just was wondering if that, not, I don't expect an answer right now, but maybe if the city manager can come back with a response as to whether that would be possible to do virtually. Um, I've had a, a number of people recently pass away and, um, and um, questions have arisen around, you know, uh, consultation that the library used to give. Um, and it would be great if we could bring that back. It is a free service. It's, I think, 20 minute free consultation. And, um, you know, the pandemic doesn't stop everything. So it would be great if we could bring that back in one form or another. Um, but other than that, I think uh, everything seems to be uh, really going great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and, um, and conclude it by thanking the 20 individuals that were reappointed this evening to committee commissions and boards. Uh, they've signed up for uh, another tour, shall we say. And again, they're the ones that, we, as we heard tonight, that, that actually uh, do the work and come before us annually. But I want to thank uh, uh, all of those that stepped forward again to said, sign me up. So thanks to them. With that said, um, everyone, let's uh, be mindful and be safe this Halloween. It's going to be a different time, but let's, let's keep in mind uh, everybody's health and safety. With that, we go ahead and adjourn to the next regular city council meeting, which will be held on November the 10th, 2020, at 7 o'clock. Everyone, be safe and have a good evening. Thank you.